Michigan and all over the place. We'll talk to you later during the worship service, but we welcome you to Temple this morning, time we have together to study the Word of God. Father, I pray, Lord, that you give me the gift of teaching now. You said to commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. I need wisdom, Lord. I need wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn to Luke 16, 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 16. The, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, The law and the prophets, the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Navim, Ketuvim, and Torah make up the Old Testament. Three basic divisions of the Old Testament. These are divisions that have been around for a long time. These are the way that, this is the way the Jews observe the Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the writings. Torah, Navim, Ketuvim. The Lord Jesus here in Luke 16, 16, 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John, John the Baptist. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Now, if I, if, and I know some good brethren, I love them, they, I respect them greatly, who do not differentiate between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. They make it the same, all right? They make it the same. They say the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Uh, this is a uh, conundrum for them. How do you press into the kingdom of God? The Bible said in John chapter number 3, except you be born again, you can't even see it. You have to be born of the Spirit of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. The two of them run concurrently many times at the same time on this earth, but not always. The kingdom of heaven was what Christ preached in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in that Sermon on the Mount, he said, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So he told them then to be prepared for the violent take it by force. Luke chapter number 20, he told them to go out and buy a sword. You'd be surprised at how many people have no idea that that's in the Bible. All they can quote is where, smite you on one cheek and turn the other. There's a time for both. Yes, there is. There's a time by the grace of God when you should allow yourself to be smitten on both cheeks. For the witness and purpose of Christ. But there's also a time when you take up a sword. If someone kicks the door down in your house, do you just run and hide or do you protect your children and your family? The reason for the sword is because of what in 606 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar saw. He saw an image of a, of a, of a huge uh, man-like thing that started with Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, went to the Darius and the Medes and Persians, and then Alexander the Great, the Grecians, and then it went down into the kingdom or the kings of Rome, the, the, uh, the Caesars, starting with Julius Caesar and the Republic. It goes down to the, the Rome, the Roman Republic, all right? And then it splits, 1054 A.D., one leg, the other leg. One represented the eastern branch of the Roman Empire that Constantine established and renamed Byzantium Constantinople. And the western branch of the Roman Empire, which is Rome itself, which is a totally different study, and, and it's an intriguing thing. When you get into it, it's amazing at the things that you see how as they developed all those hundreds of years ago, how that you see what's happening today is a direct result of that. But what happened to the eastern branch is that, that, uh, that Constantine called it uh, Constantinople, embraced the Christian faith right before he died, and was baptized, I think they say, even taken off of his deathbed and baptized because Constantine felt like baptism was essential for salvation and he did not want to be baptized and mess up and go to hell. Are you following? Because he believed he could lose his salvation. So he waited till the last moment to be baptized and sealed and then passed on. Whether Constantine was a real Christian or not is, is left up between God and Constantine. You, can, you, have, you have defenders and detractors on both sides. But in 325 A.D., he convened the Council of Nicaea to establish what we believe about Christ. And it was to, one of the things it was to counter was the Arian controversy, 
which taught that Christ was a created God. This is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching today. When Charles Taz Russell, back in the 1800s, uh, Bible study gave out all of this stuff. It's like he created something. He didn't create anything. All he did was go back in, in, in time past and pull up an old, ancient Gnostic doctrine. Because it's Gnosticism that Christ is a created God. The Gnostics believe that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is a demiurge. He's a created God, but doesn't know it. But let's stick with our subject. We come down to Rome, and Rome is split into two legs. And then at the bottom of the legs, you have the feet. And the Bible says in the book of Daniel, chapter number 2, the feet is clay and iron. And it says something strange about it. It says, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. The seed of men. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent. Now we have seed involved. And I told you just a few days ago how the Bible said, he shall see his seed, his children, and prolong his days, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that are born of the Son of God, which gets into the bride of Christ and who you are and your identity. And what is the bride of Christ about? And what's the purpose in Christ having a bride to begin with? Why does Christ need a bride? Why does Jehovah need a wife in the Old Testament? See, these, there's reasons for these things. So we come down to the end time, when the end of the times of the Gentiles, when you have an image standing on its feet, and its feet is a mixture of clay and iron. Iron is never set in a good context in the Bible. Not one time. All through the Bible you find iron, but it's never in a good context. And so we have iron mixed with clay. They shall mingle themselves with a seed. Now I'm going to get into a thing with you this morning to kind of give you an idea of what's going on when we're talking about seed and who we are. Now we just celebrated July the 4th, 1776. What happened July the 4th, 1776? <clears throat> we declared our independence. Now Great Britain didn't hand it to us, right? It took eight years. <coughs> Have you ever been in London on July the fourth? <laughs> I doubt if they're doing much. I doubt if they're doing much over there on the fourth of July, right? <laughs> but anyway, the United States, as a republic, was born, or it declared itself to come into existence. It rebelled against the authority of King George. So the United States, with its thirteen British colonies, came into existence by rebellion. Therefore, it connects the number 13 with rebellion. How many of you know that uh, two days ago was Friday the 13th? 13th day. All right. Friday is the sixth day of the week. Six is the number of man. 13 is the number of rebellion. Did you know that the Knights Templar's leader, his name was Jacques de Molay, he was burned at the stake on the 13th day. Friday the 13th, he was burned at the stake. So it's passed down to our culture today and all over the world that Friday the 13th is a bad thing. It's a bad day. All right. Why was he burned at the stake? Because the king of France didn't want to pay his bills. At least that's what they say. You know, didn't want to pay his bills. But in any event, we see coming down here a line. A line. We see a progression of a line. That's moving through history. Now here we are today, all right? How many has ever heard of Cecil Rhodes and the Round Table? You ever heard of Cecil Rhodes? They called it Rhodesia, all right? Well, they changed the name of it a few years back to Zimbabwe. And where is it? It's on the eastern area of South Africa, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. Who was Cecil Rhodes? He was a wealthy Englishman, Englishman. Now we're going to start making connections. He was a wealthy Englishman who firmly believed that the British Empire, the British-speaking people, were destined by the hand of God to be the rulers of the world and that they would set about, however necessary, to bring about a one-world government. Now, how many of you know what the Union Jack is? The Union Jack is the official flag, Great Britain. 1801, the Union Jack was... Uh, 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 brought into, was, you know, commissioned to be the flag of England, the Union Jack. It has three crosses on it. It's quite remarkable. Three crosses. It's got the cross of St. George. It's got the cross of uh, 
Patrick of Ireland, and it's got the cross of St. Andrew, one of the twelve. Right now, the president is in Scotland playing golf at the birthplace of golf in the, in the land of St. Andrew. The Scottish people have always been fierce in their personal identity and they desire to be separate from, from, from England in the sense that they want to control their own destiny. Uh, so in Scotland, you have the cross of, of uh, St. Andrew. It is a blue cross like this because tradition teaches that St. Andrew was crucified on a cross like this. Like this. In Ireland, you have a red cross, just like St. Andrew's. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. Drove out all the snakes, they say. That, of course, is tradition. I've been checking around. Does anybody know if there are any snakes in Ireland? I've been there. I'll tell you this right now. Ireland's a beautiful place. It is beautiful. It's called the Emerald Isle. I went to the castle of the Blarney Stone. These people were lined up, and you have to bend over like this to reach up and kiss the Blarney Stone. And they said to me, you're next. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thanks. I'm not going to kiss something that 10,000 people have just kissed. Are you? <laughs> anyway, that, that was, I'll never forget that castle, the Blarney, Blarney Stone. It was quite a thing to see. But anyway, St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. Now, St. George is supposed to be a Roman soldier who was of Greek descent, who was martyred for his faith in Christ before Constantine, while the Christians were still being persecuted. Therefore, his, his banner was taken up by the Crusaders. St. George's cross is a red cross, like this. Now, it's not, it's not a cross with a bar at the top. It, you know, down a little bit away from the top, but it's in the center. How many's ever seen a flag with a red cross on it like that? How many's ever seen a, a picture of a, of a crusader and they carry their banner and it's a red cross? That's St. George's cross. They fight under that cross. Now let's put this together. We've got a cross in Ireland, we've got a cross in Scotland, and we've got a cross in England. We've got three company, countries that come together. Three uh, identities that come together create the United Kingdom. All of them fly the banner of the cross. It almost think, almost make you think that they got something to do with Christians, wouldn't it? They do. Officially, they do. Did you know that when Queen Elizabeth was crowned as the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II was crowned as the Queen of England, she sat on a throne that had a stone beneath it. The stone of scone, they call it, or the, the uh, stone of destiny. So what stone is this? Tradition has it that that stone was the stone that Jacob lay his head on in the Old Testament and that it was carried by Jeremiah and the daughter of Zedekiah, king of Israel. It was carried by Jeremiah, Zedekiah, and uh, Baruch, his scribe, into England. So now we get into it. We've got a connection here with England and Christianity and Judaism that you don't find in the United States. Now, how many of you believe that, uh, that, you, that uh, everybody has an eschatology? That's the doctrine of last things. Eschatos is the Greek word. It means last things. All right. Eschatology is the doctrine, study of last things. I'm premillennial. It doesn't mean that I can't fellowship with a post or a millennial. I know some good people. I know some pre preachers in this town that are amillennial, uh, postmillennial, and they're good men. They love the Lord. No question about it. You know, I can fellowship with somebody whose eschatology is different from mine. I can't fellowship with somebody whose theology as it relates to Christ is different. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. If you don't believe that, you're not my brother. See? But anyway, I'm premillennial in eschatology. That means that I believe... That the world, evil men and seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that the only thing that's going to change this world is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ physically, visibly, to bring his kingdom with him. Now, an amillennial means no millennium. And, it's, and that was uh, pretty popular in, uh, in mainline Christian denominations in the country. 
They believe that the millennium was a spiritual time on earth when Christ was reigning through his church, and uh, it was a kind of a spiritual reign. But post-millennial, this is the one we want to deal with. This has to do with Cecil Rhodes. Post-millennial is the idea that the millennium is going to be a time when the church has brought the world under the canopy of Christ and has converted the world and brought it into salvation and knowledge of the Lord, and that once it does that, that the earth or the world is going to be changed. It's going to be turned into a utopia. And then when Christ comes back, he takes his kingdom. They'll just hand it to him. They'll hand him a kingdom that they have prepared for him, and he'll come and he'll reign over a converted world. If you've been saved any period of time, you know better the world is converting the church. The church is not converting the world. All right. Herbert W. Armstrong, in his booklet, The United States and Britain in Prophecy, the story of Jeremiah's journey to Ireland with the daughter of King Zedekiah of Judah, comes to life under the author's pen. Here's what he says. The real ancient history of Ireland is very extensive, though colored with some legend, but with the facts of biblical history and prophecy in mind, one can easily sift out the legend from the true history in studying ancient Irish annals. Throwing out that which is obviously legendary, we glean from various histories of Ireland the following. Long prior to 700 B.C., a strong colony called Tuatha de Danann, tribe of Dan, arrived in ships, drove out other tribes, and settled there. Later in the days of David, a colony of the line of Zara arrived in Ireland from the Near East. What we have then, according to this, is that England has become the place where the ten lost tribes and others, as it relates to Israel, have gone. Now, they don't stop there. They don't stop there. Joseph of Arimathea. How many of you know who that is now? Joseph of Arimathea. We think that that is his garden, which is called the Garden Tomb. I've been there six times. It's a beautiful place. We can't prove that that's the tomb Christ was in, but it's right next to a defaced rock that looks like a skull. And you can see that skull from the northern wall of Jerusalem. And when that British general looked across there, Charles Gordon, he saw that and he said to himself, man, that looks like a skull. And so they called it Gordon's Calvary. By the way, Charles Gordon was a Christian. And... Uh, a lot of those British, uh, a lot of the Brits, Brits are, no question about that. I mean, this, you know. But anyway, the, uh, the idea is that Joseph of Arimathea went to England, and there's different stories. One of them goes like this. Joseph of Arimathea went to England and carried with him the Holy Grail. The Grail is the cup that Christ drank the wine out of at the Last Supper. Carried that with him to England. Another take on it is that Joseph of Arimathea and the Lord Jesus himself traveled to England. And uh, obviously before the Lord was crucified, but he traveled to England. And the reason for this is because the Lord Jesus was giving his approval on the fact that England is the location of, the, of, of Israel, the Old Testament. Now, here's where it gets sticky. Now, follow with me. This, this gets sticky. It gets real sticky here. How many of you know what blood libel is? You ever heard that term, blood libel? Well, through the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and so forth, the European powers, the European people, accused the Jews of stealing their children and, and, and draining the blood from their bodies and drinking that blood out in, the, out in the forest because they said that the Jews were the seed of Satan. Now meditate on that for a moment. Start putting this together. Now all of them don't say the same thing. When I'm giving you what I'm giving you this morning is a general overview and survey and I want you to understand that from when I started until this point, I don't believe a bit of it, okay? <laughs> Somebody up there say, Lawson's teaching British Israelism over there. No, I'm telling you what it is, but it doesn't mean I believe it. 
But anyway, the, the, the idea is that the real Israel of God. Okay, is that term in the Bible? Yes, it is. The Israel of God. That term is in the scripture. Who is the Israel of God? Well, according to British Israelism, it's them. All right? And that the people in the Holy Land right now are Khazars. They're imposters. They're not, they're not, they're not part of the real Israel of God. Therefore, they are the seed of the serpent. There's a lot of people on the internet right now that are teaching this. That these people are the seed of the serpent. Now let's look at it politically. If the people in Israel are the seed of the serpent, that means that anything the United States does to support Israel, they're supporting a satanic seed. You see that? They're supporting a satanic seed. Do you realize how many people in this world hate Israel? They say they're imposters. They say they are. They say they're nothing. Well, I've heard one say it this way: said that Israel is nothing in the world more than 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 Hebrew-speaking Europeans. They hate them. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the synagogue of Satan. Okay, the synagogue of Satan. Now, you got to be very careful with this, but this is what's going on. This is the way I see it. That there is an elite of the elite. And they are running this world. And they believe that they have been commissioned of God to rule the world. And they will manipulate anybody or anything for gaining that goal. This is why that this globalist economy that's being ministered from Brussels, Belgium, was rejected by the British people, and, they, and, and this rejection was called Brexit. In other words, we reject it and we're exiting. We're coming out. We're coming out of the global economy. We're coming out of the European Union. We'll make our own trade deals. Do you remember when Obama went over there and talked to the British Prime Minister, and Prime Minister was talking... Asking a question in reference to Brexit, and Obama said to them, uh, we can't deal, we're, in other words, to paraphrase him, we're not going to deal with you directly as a country, England. We will deal with you through the European Union. That's what Obama said to them. You know why he said that? He's a globalist. Now we have Donald Trump, the President of the United States, who right now is working feverishly to establish a trade with Great Britain. Because the United States is the largest trading partner of Great Britain. So what does that make Donald Trump? He's not a globalist. Do you want to know why they hate him? They don't hate Donald Trump because he had some tryst with a prostitute years ago. He didn't go in as the pastor of America. They don't hate him because 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 of his position on on uh, you know on social issues stuff like. Here's why they hate him. They hate him because he is not one of them. He's not a globalist. That's why they hate him. So what does that mean? It means that globalism has taken a setback, and it's it's going to be very interesting to see what takes place in the near future. Be very interesting to see what what they what they're going to do, because globalism is the idea that the whole world is going to have one trade, one one religion. It's going to be united in a brotherhood that's ministered from the UN. That the whole world will be one great family, and this is going to bring utopia to the earth. It's going to bring. It's going. To, we're going to be able to live in peace among ourselves. The elite believe that. We know better than that. We know that there's not going to be any peace until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Prince of Peace, don't we? It's good for us to know this stuff, though. Now think about it. Think about it. France is not the, is, uh, Paris, France is not the seat of globalism. Berlin, Germany is not the seat of globalism. London, England. 
London. Britannia rules the waves, the British Empire. They had an empire larger than any empire that had ever existed on this earth, Great Britain. Did you know that they went into Africa, Great Britain did, in the colonial period when they colonized? The colony, the colonial period, they went in down there, they took, they took, they took the people, they established parliaments, they created parliaments in their countries and taught them how to govern themselves. And uh, Cecil Rhodes said this. He said, I want to see the day when a rail leaves out of Rhodesia, where I am here in Africa. I want to see the day come when a rail, railroad, a train, leaves out of here in Rhodesia and goes all the way to Cairo, to the Mediterranean Sea, and never leaves British land. Now, is that, <laughs> does that tell you what's going on here? Okay. Does that tell you what's going on? Most Americans couldn't care less what kind of government they're under. As long as they've got a paycheck and as long as they've got a six-pack in sex, as long as they've got the comforts of life, they don't, they don't care. It doesn't matter to them one bit. Most people in the world are like that. Not all of them, but most of them. So if the government can provide what they want for the people, then the government can be, can, 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 can be uh, created in any form they want. And that's exactly what's coming. Revelation 13 says that nobody will be able to buy or sell except they have the mark of the beast. So what I say all that for? Because in my study, the way I see it, the seat, the seat of the, uh, of, uh, of the one world government is located in Britain. Now you say, well, what about Brussels, Brussels, Belgium? Isn't that the seat of the EU? The EU's coming apart. Germany, did you know that they say this time and time again the last few days, Germany is the most powerful country in Europe. How many have heard that? Do you know why Germany's the most powerful? It's the richest. They bombed them into oblivion. Dresden, Germany was turned into a melting. It was horrible. Dresden, Germany, Berlin, look at what they did. And yet, out of those ashes, the German people have rebuilt Germany, and now they're loaning money to keep Greece afloat. It is the German, it's the Germans that are the richest people, and they're getting tired of it. And the Prime Minister of Germany, Angela Merkel, Merkel, is hated and despised by her own people for opening up the borders and allowing all of these immigrants to come into Germany. And if you just do a little bit of reading, you'll find out that the German women now are scared to death to walk down the street because they're afraid they're going to be grabbed and raped before they ever get to where they're going. And who are they going to be raped by? They're going to be raped by these immigrants. So why all of this, preacher? The reason they want to do this, they want turmoil. They want to tear everything up. Why are they tearing up the American home? They want turmoil. They want to tear it up. So once you tear it up, tear it down, then you can rebuild it. And that's exactly. It's a Hegelian dialect. All right? It's a simple thing. But when you look at it, it works. Thesis, antithesis, or antithesis, synthesis. We've got the present condition. All right? That's not what they want. So they'll give you something that's intolerable. That's the antithesis. Something intolerable. Then you begin to scream for help like the Israelites did in the book of Exodus. You begin to scream for relief. All right. So what happens? Then they come in with the solution. The synthesis. And the synthesis is what they wanted to begin with. But they knew they had to take you to the extreme to get you back to where they wanted you. They don't want a world in turmoil. They want a world in peace. But the way to get there is to create turmoil. And that's, what they're ha that's what's happening. They've destroyed the home in America. It's terrible what's happened in the country. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. By force of arms. That's how they do it. 
These kingdoms, the Gentiles, now these are all Gentile kingdoms, the Gentile kingdoms will be built at the, at, at the, at the muzzle of a gun. Yeah, yeah they will. Amen. As one old boy said, God's on the side of the ones with the biggest guns. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> but that's the way they see it. Yeah. Whose side is God on, after all? Well, the Bible says Christ went to the cross and tasted death for every man. British, British Israelism has a lot of things about it that answer a lot of things, okay? I'll say that right up here front. But here's the problem with British Israelism. Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter number 14 clearly tells you that you have 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel and it names them. That means that there has to be an Israel and there has to be Jews here that you can get them from, right? Right? No, he's not. Dan was excluded because he set up his own idol priesthood in the north. He sure did. So the sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, took his place. Yes. Absolutely. But how do you explain 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel? That's 144,000. And it says plainly, from the tribes of Israel. 12,000. And as far as the idea that you have lost tribes, the 12 lost tribes of Israel, doesn't it tell you in the New Testament somebody was of the tribe of, uh, of uh, what is it? I hadn't, I hadn't, hadn't mentioned this in quite some time. But, there, but it's mentioned, I think it is Zacharias. It's either Zacharias or it's, it's Anna, the, Anna the prophetess or it's Simeon. It's either Anna or Zacharias. Of the tribe of Asher. You remember that? It says that in the New Testament. Well, Asher is one of the so-called lost tribes. See? The ten northern lost tribes. Yet if they had an identity and knew what tribe they came from, that one wasn't lost, was it? No. But anyway, can you be a British Israelite and be a Christian? Yes, you can. Can you be messed up and be a Christian? How many believe you can? <laughs> You sure can be messed up. <laughs> you can be messed up big time. Just make sure you got Christ right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> make sure you got Him right. Joseph of Arimathea. Have you ever heard Jerusalem the hymn? How many's ever heard it? I started to record it and bring it in, play it for you, like I did the the Hatikva the other day, the national anthem of Israel, and I forgot to do it. I got tied up in something and forgot. But you need to hear. Maybe I can do it for you next Sunday. You need to hear Jerusalem the hymn. It's a big deal over there in England. And the words go something like this. Did in ancient time the feet of, uh, I believe, of the Savior and so forth walk the hills of England? That's quite an intriguing thought, isn't it? That, he would, that he'd been there. You see the point? My point's this. If God sent the ten northern tribes to England... If Joseph of Arimathea and the Lord Jesus made a visit to England, and all of this happened to the British people, and their, and their flag, the Union Jack, has got three crosses on it, they've got a connection with the Bible that everybody else doesn't have. And so when Queen Victoria ruled over the whole world, because she did it one time, when Victoria was the queen, the, the sun never set on the British Empire, then she was simply fulfilling the mandate of God to the British people. And they believe it. Uh, they say that Winston Churchill and, uh, and, uh, and Franklin Roosevelt had a big falling out. Uh, the biggest falling out they had was, was uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and you know who that was. He was the only president elected four times in our country. The wartime president. And, 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 and uh, uh, Winston Churchill. The falling out between those two men was over this. Winston Churchill believed that the British people had a right to rule the world with an empire. He wrote a massive volume called The History of the, of the English-Speaking People. Churchill did. And, of course, uh, uh, Roosevelt didn't buy into that. Where do you stand this morning? What's our purpose on this earth? Is our purpose on, on this earth to tear down kingdoms? Sedition to overthrow them? Or is it to convert people to Christ? Is there a difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There's a big difference. What is the kingdom of God, preacher? It's a spiritual kingdom that can only be entered by the new birth. No other way. All right. Well, I'm done. I've talked enough. I'm hoarse. I've been up here ranting, <laughs> rambling on for uh, <laughs> 40 minutes nearly. Anybody have a question about what we've covered, and, and we'll let you go. Yes, sir. Well, they're going to lose that identity anyway because the Bible says in Christ they're neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. That's why it's not important in Israel what tribe you come from except for the tribe of Levi. Yeah, to be a Jew, Kohen, Kohen. Uh, in Hebrew, in, uh, in, uh, in Romans chapter number 11, there's no way that Romans 11 could have any meaning at all except that God has blinded the Jews and that one day he's going to bring them back and restore them. And uh, he'll give them the earth because they will inherit the earth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd like to say one thing to the congregation a lot of them. Where are the birth pains? You can look at it and you can see the birth pains are here. A lot of folks are not paying attention to what's happening in the world and in this country. Like England doing all the demonstration against Trump. And all of this, they forgot one thing. How many of our boys lost their lives for saving England? So you're in the birth pain right now. The day after the demonstration, England had a, uh, another demonstration as pro Trump. Yeah. That they didn't quite know. Yeah. Well, I saw a video clip of, uh, of that first demonstration, and it had some of them were carrying big signs that said LGBT. You know the LGBT community. They're, that crowd is the is the left here in this country. Progressive liberalism. That's all they are. They just happen to be Brits. Same crowd. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Yeah. Well. Uh huh. Well, it's when you look at when you look at Great Britain. Look at how small that island is. You think about this now. Look at this small island over here, and the power that they have projected throughout the world. It's mind-boggling, really. I mean, the Brit uh, the, how many Brits are there right now? Thirty-five million, sixty between thirty and sixty million. I forget the number. Of the last time I saw. But the whole purpose of, of England is that whenever they created or wrote or translated the King James Bible. That's when they gained all the power. They weren't, they weren't nothing before the King James Bible. And then when they turned their back on the King James Bible, that's when they ceased to be a, a world power. But they still have the world bank. And that's where uh, they, when they When they came out with that white paper and reneged on the Balfour Declaration, 
They went straight down. They lost that. Uh, they lost that. Well, they have to buy. They they have to because they're an economic powerhouse. They're a manufacturing dynasty in Germany. I mean, they're building, 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 and, and making. You know, it's quite a thing. They sent the smallest, the smallest uh, drill in the world, drill bit. Sent the smallest drill bit in the world to Germany. Germany drilled a hole in it and sent it back to them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not German. I don't have a speck. I reckon have a speck of German blood in me. I don't go back. My my daughter gave me a thing on ancestry. Bought it for me for the for my uh, uh, forget what it was for. But anyway, I'm scared to death to go into it because all I've ever known is bootleggers and bank robbers in my outfit. So I'm, I, I'm <laughs> no tell no tell what you're liable to find. <laughs> oh me. I'm glad I'm saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> All right. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll let you go.